Well, we've had one great speaker, and we're about to have another one that's just going to blow you away. Uh, I've had a wonderful afternoon with uh, Sebastian Gorka, and I am so delighted that he has agreed to come down and be our speaker. Now, probably some of you have heard of him before. You may have seen him on Fox News, and you may already know that he served with Donald Trump in his campaign for president, and then he later was tapped by President Trump to work in his administration as a policy advisor. Uh, I would like to share with you maybe a few things that you don't know about him. I'm not going to take up much time because I want to leave it to him. But he was raised by parents that uh, when communist Hungary, they fled communist Hungary and went to the United Kingdom, and that's where he was born. He learned to love freedom from a very early age because of what his parents had been through. That's a very special background of his family, and also because of the influence of conservative warrior and England's prime minister, Margaret Thatcher, that Sebastian learned how to fight totalitarianism. Total, total, blah, blah, blah. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> My tongue's twisted. Ideologies. <laughs> Sebastian later served in the British Army uh, in the Military Intelligence Unit. And after the terrorist attacks in America in September 2001, Dr. Gorka became a professor. He was on a Pentagon-funded counterterrorism program based in Germany. Seven years later, he moved to America. We brought his family, went to work for the Defense Department, and on, in 2012, he became a United States citizen. Welcome to America, Dr. Gorka. <laughs> and the final thing I'll say is he's written several books. His most recent book is The War for America's Soul. And also, you may not see him as much on Fox News right now because he has his own radio program. And I would like for you to go to his website, SEB. Dot Gorker at Okay, then I'll let you say it again when you get up here because you're probably going to do it anyway. You can hear it online. It's on Salem Radio Network, which I don't know that there's any affiliates here in Birmingham doing that. And Dr. Gorker, you can come on up as I ask this audience to give him a warm welcome. Bill, you heard that I am a legal immigrant, <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> I'm still learning American English, but I tell you, I learned something tonight, Elizabeth, kiss my grits, <laughs> I'm going to use that, thank you. And yes, we need a lot more ladies like you. Uh, Bill, thank you for looking after me so kindly today, so graciously. Thank you, Uni, for keeping Phyllis's spirit alive and for everything you do for this nation. Uh, thank you, uh, General Sessions, for coming tonight. I'd like to recognize Judge Moore, Lieutenant Governor, and uh, somebody asked the, the elected officials or candidates to stand up, and you were right to do so. Can I ask our veterans to stand up? All of you. Thank you for keeping us safe here in the greatest nation on God's earth. I have a, a few stories to tell you because stories are how we win. We have the truth on our side, but truth is not enough. We must remember why Ronald Reagan was so incredible at what he did. And it relates and connects to my old boss, President Trump. Does anybody recall, before he ran for governor, what Ronald Reagan's job was? Bill got it. Ronald Reagan was paid by General Electric to travel the nation and to stop at each plant and to give speeches to the managers and the workers in those GE plants. On what? 
on why our republic is the greatest form of government known to man and why free markets are the greatest way to create prosperity for all. He gave literally hundreds of speeches on the principles of our republic. The man who would later be described to us as the amiable dunce. Who wrote those speeches? He did. Every single one. So once he became president, once he became a national politician, what did he have at his fingertips? He had all the facts. He knew the truth. He knew why America is great and why we must become the shining city on the hill once more. But far more importantly than just the truth, he could communicate the truth. Because of his time in Hollywood, he knew that another slide projection of GDP growth rates or the Laffer curve doesn't exactly get you excited. And you have to talk to the soul of a human being. You have to connect. You have to talk about the bright colors of our American future. A morning for America. That's what we forget as conservatives. And that's what my old boss, Donald Trump, has brought back. Because he has an authentic love of our country that you cannot fake and you cannot hide. I traveled with him on Air Force One to a rally in Youngstown, Ohio. We landed on an Air Force base, and of course, what is the first thing he does? There's, there's no press there, so this isn't, you know, for a press show-off moment. He gets off Air Force One, and before he gets in the beast, he walks to every single local police outrider who's going to escort the convoy and shakes their hand because he respects our police as much as he loves our military. Then we ride in the convoy for about 15 minutes to the stadium. On the left-hand side, what do we see? It's Youngstown. So it's disused steel mill after disused, dilapidated steel mill. On the right-hand side, it's locals with their red mega hats waving the American flag. We get to the stadium, and he's in the back with the VIPs, and I'm in the front and hanging out with the crowd, taking selfies. <laughs> and I realized something. Everyone in that stadium, thousands of Americans, were all former Democrats. Their parents, their grandparents, salt of the earth manual laborers from Youngstown, Ohio steel mills. And when he came out on stage, well, at first it was the first lady, Melania, and then the president. The whole building erupted in an organic chant of drain the swamp, drain the swamp, USA, USA. In Youngstown, Ohio. Why? Because every single man and woman in that building looked at that president and said, you know, he might be a billionaire, but if I were a president like him, I'd also be eating Big Macs on Air Force One. <laughs> he connects with the American people. And that is our challenge today as conservatives. We can't just peddle the facts. We've got to connect with our fellow Americans especially former Democrats, especially the undecided and the independents. Because the job is very, very serious. I explained to some people earlier, in 2016, what a glorious night it was, November the 8th. I was sitting on the porch of my house with my teenage son, watching the, the returns come in. What an amazing night. And on that day, we have to appreciate a very small, grace-filled window was opened for our nation. 
Hillary Clinton had spent $1.4 billion on the election, with a B, billion. Apart from a couple of exceptions, Fox and Breitbart and Salem, the whole of the media enterprise was in her back pocket. The New York Times, the Huffington Post, on the day of the election, I saved a tweet, said Hillary Clinton has a 95% chance of winning. <laughs> and, and Donald Trump has a 1.6%. Not 1.7, not 1.5, 1.6. Pretty impressive. But we won. We won. A man, remember this, a man who had never run before, a man who had never held public office. For the first time in our nation's history, we elected a non-swamp individual. From George Washington to Obama, every single president for 44 presidents was either a retired general or a politician. Every single one. And for the first time, we said, no, enough. Enough is enough. Washington is broken. Both parties, both parties have betrayed us. And we want somebody who is not owned by the unions, not owned by tobacco, not owned by Big Pharma, who is owned by nobody. And that is why they're impeaching him. Because he is a threat to the swamp. We have a very serious challenge ahead of us. Because that grace-filled window is getting smaller by the day. I opened my new book, The War for America's Soul, with a story. A story I had to get my daughter's permission to include in the book. And you'll understand why in a moment. My daughter just graduated last year from four years at a New England college. A college which was founded as a seminary to serve God. Which today is a pretty rabidly liberal institution. She was an amazing student. She held four jobs down, as well as being the co-captain of her crew team. Four jobs. She ran the coffee shop, TA, RA, and then assisted in the writing center, helping students with their writing skills. In the first year of being in college, you may have heard the story, she was at a celebration with her fellow students at a college building when she stepped out onto the top deck and all three decks separated from the building and collapsed on each other. She had nerve damage through her leg, was on crutches for weeks. It's tough, but she persevered, summa cum laude, Phi Beta Kappa. So when it was time for her graduation, I wanted it to be about her and only her. Three weeks before the graduation, because she had joined a new institute at the college called the Churchill Institute, named after Winston Churchill, whose mission was to celebrate the values of Judeo-Christian civilization. Three weeks before the graduation, my daughter's face was plastered on posters around the campus and on Facebook with the following written beneath it. This is the face of white nationalism. Despite my daughter's research project in her law class being helping women who had been abused by their partners in terms of their financial capacity to maintain credit ratings and stand up for themselves after a divorce or separation. Mostly minority women. That, that's what my daughter did as her project, helping minority women reestablish themselves after financial abuse. So when it came to the graduation, I said, I am not going to be a distraction. I'm sure most of the parents at this college are liberals. I, I want this to be about her. 
So I did something a bit weird. I hid. I got to the quad. It's a beautiful Trinity College in Connecticut. Beautiful ancient quad. Well, by American standards. <laughs> Hundreds of folding chairs. Beautiful stage. And I decided not to sit with my family. I left my wife, my mother-in-law, my sister-in-law to sit down with the crowds. And I found a massive oak tree. And I hid behind the oak tree. So I wouldn't be a distraction, wouldn't be recognized by somebody, there wouldn't be a scene. I could see the stage. I could take a photograph of my daughter when she graduated, but it would be about her. And things were going fine until halfway through the ceremony, several of the uh, campus police saw me and started walking over to me. And I thought, please, not today. But it was okay, they wanted selfies. <laughs> but this is where it gets interesting. So one of the officers told me, hey, we, we know what happened with your daughter. We're ready if something happens today. We're, we've got our eye on her. Don't worry. And I could tell something was bothering this officer. And when his colleagues left, he said to me, I, I need to tell you something. When those posters went up calling your daughter a white nationalist, we have a former Fed on our staff. I mean, these are great guys, former state Connecticut, former Hartford PD, former FBI agents. He said, we had a very effective uh, investigator on our team. And he found out within hours who it was, which of the students had taken your daughter's image and plastered her over college and on Facebook. As soon as we identified them, the associate dean of the college came to the police department and said, bury the investigation. These are the people who lecture us about social justice. Social justice, as long as you agree with them. OK, so I filed that away. My daughter's name is called. She gets her diploma, ceremony finishes, caps are flung in the air, it's time to celebrate. So I leave my little hidey hole and decide to walk back to my family and reunite with my daughter. And in the throng, I get separated from my group. The young girl maybe 19 years old, maybe 80 pounds dripping wet, takes a beeline towards me in the crowd, gets within a few feet of me, and says, are you Sebastian Gorka? Are you the Sebastian Gorka that worked in the Trump White House? And I'm so happy, I'm radiant, I'm happy for my daughter. Hundreds of people celebrating together. And stupid old me smiles, extends my hand, says, yes, that's me. And I'm going to edit this part. This little girl says, well, then F you, you effing Nazi. Now, I've seen a lot, and I have a reputation for being a tough guy. And I've been abused, especially in the White House, by those who hate the president. But I was taken aback. It's not good for a talk radio host to be speechless. But then I realized, hang, hang on, hang on, hang on. This is. This is just wrong. And I'm not going to let this lie. So once I caught myself, I followed that girl 
back to her group. And she walked up to a woman who I guess was her mother and an older woman who I guess was her grandmother. And I said to her, who the hell do you think you are? My parents as children suffered under Nazi occupation. My father, as a schoolboy, escorted his Jewish school friends to school who were wearing the Star of David to make sure the Nazi occupation forces wouldn't abuse and spit on his school friends. My father was then arrested, tortured, and imprisoned for life by the communists. Who the hell do you think you are to call me an effing Nazi? The girl's mother, slack-jawed, looked at her and said, did, did, you, did you say that to this man? And here comes the kicker. 19-year-old girl, born in America, with a rictus-like grin, like the Joker from Batman, says, yes, I did. We have a lot of work to do, my friends. A lot of work to do. That girl lives in the richest, freest nation this world has ever seen. Ever seen. And she has so been brainwashed that she actually believes Nazis work in the White House. There's an amazing organization called the Victims of uh, Communism Memorial Foundation in D.C. Keeps alive the memory of the horrors of communism and then educates on how communism is still persecuting people in Cuba, North Korea, China, and so on. Every year they, do a, they have a massive gala like this, and before it they commission a, a large survey with, a, with YouGov the prestigious YouGov organization. Before last year's gala in November, the president of the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation broke the news on my show, America First, of the results of their latest survey. According to the foundation and YouGov, 72% of millennial Americans under the age of 30, would prefer to live in a socialist or communist America. Not 12%, not 32%, 72%. Despite the fact that Karl Marx's ideology took the lives of more than 100 million people in just the last century and is still taking the lives of people today. So let me, um, let me close on this and then I'll take some questions. You heard from Elizabeth this question of courage. And God bless all of you, especially those running for office who are volunteers for organizations like the Eagle Forum. God bless all of you who are here today, who volunteered on campaigns, who've stood up for our republic. But it's not enough. It's not enough. We are on the precipice. One last anecdote. Last year, I was at an event like this. It was for um, the GOP. And I arrived early. It was a very swanky club. And I parked. The car park was full. The parking lot was full. I parked at the back of the lot. And I had to walk through the whole lot. 
And I realized something really weird. So I walked through the lot. And I filed it away. And I opened my speech with it. And this is not a political message. It's a value message. This isn't about the GOP. It's about our republic. I opened my speech at that gala with the following caveat. You know how people say, don't take this personally? I said, take this personally. <laughs> because I walked through that car park, through that lot, to this gala event, and I couldn't tell, apart from my car, my Mustang and one beat up old Ford Escort, I couldn't tell what event was occurring at this club. Because I didn't see one bumper sticker for the president except on my car and that beat up Ford. And I'm not here to support the GOP. This isn't a political speech. I want you to think about courage and what courage means. You have people in this room, Judge Moore, the Attorney General, who've demonstrated what courage looks like. It's now up to every single American who loves this country to ask themselves, what have I done for our republic? I'm not here to represent a political party because I said it in the White House, and I've said it since I left the White House. Donald John Trump was elected despite the GOP, not thanks to the GOP. That's the harsh truth. So I have a request to all of you. When you go home tonight and you look forward for the next 300 odd days, I'd like you to look into your soul and ask yourself, what am I prepared to do for this country? Writing checks is great, volunteering, stuffing envelopes, God bless you all, but it's not enough. We have to do more because this is the last chance, the last chance. We are in the freest, richest nation God ever created where young children are being abused with the permission of the state because their mother or their father thinks they should be a boy and not a girl. They're being physically, surgically altered in the name of an evil ideology that thinks man is not man and woman isn't woman. We are living in a nation where leading political figures wish to disestablish, wish to abolish the entities that keep you safe at night. Leading figures in one of our parties want to do away with the Department of Homeland Security and ICE. Leading figures on Capitol Hill want to create a system in which, and this isn't a joke, people make fun of this, but it's actually out there. They want to abolish your capacity to fly. They want to make red meat, meat, a memory. It sounds funny, but it's not. If Stalin could have said, I'm going to abolish red meat and make sure nobody gets to fly, they would have laughed at him. That is the face of one of our political parties today. We have a nation to save. Old school Democrats, classic Republicans together, independents. It's not about political parties. I am not here to give a political speech. I am here to make you understand the fate 
of our republic is in the balance. We have a window of freedom, and it is getting smaller and smaller by the day. One last point. We are safer and richer than we have ever been. The statistics are incontrovertible. Incontrovertible. If you just look at what's happened in the last three years, the facts are very clear. And as I speak, we have people in D.C., who wish to sabotage it all. What are you prepared to do? God bless you. Thank you, Dr. Gorka. And he had asked if he could get some questions uh, from you guys. And we're going to have time for about three questions. Good evening. Do you see the left as being self-deluded or deceptive? Is the left self-deluded or, or um, deceptive? Yes. How do we get God back in government? I mean, yes. Th think think hey. about the fact that, that that figure I told you. 70, um, the, the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, this figure that millennials, 72% of them, are, are pro-socialism or communism. That's after millions of people were killed in the name of socialism. The Black Book of Communism has the reckoning. The Black Book of Communism was written by socialist historians who had a, a, you know, a road to Canossa moment, who did the math. In the 20th century, more than 100 million people died in the name of Karl Marx and equality. 100 million. 40 nations, 4-0, tried to create Karl Marx's utopia. Every single one failed. So the idea that we have people spouting this now you have to be delusional. You have to have no sense of history. Now, when it comes to the political leaders or the actors on the, on the, on the national stage, they have no excuse. Let's just talk about what's going on right now as we're sitting here on Capitol Hill. Impeachment. Impeachment was meant to remove a president who was taking quasi-treasonous behavior. It was meant to be a bipartisan act. What has happened recently? Not one Republican has voted for impeachment. Not because there's some great party whip control of the Republican Party. There isn't. But because we have people on Capitol Hill who cannot forgive a non-politician for winning the election. They cannot forgive a man who owes nothing to them for winning the election. And again, I, I know the status of this organization, and I'm not giving a political speech. Why? Because I will rail against the Republican establishment as much as the Democrats. Look at what's going on right now. There should be no, no impeachment hearings. Zero. Neither, neither of the two charges are legal charges. Neither of them stand prima facie evidence or examination as legal charges. As a result, what should have happened on the first day of hear hearings last week? They should have been dismissed, abovo. They should have been thrown out of the Senate. as absolutely ridiculous on the face of it. But there's a lack of intestinal fortitude on Capitol Hill. And just to make sure you don't get in trouble for your 501c3 status, let me be very clear here about the GOP. 
What has the GOP done for the president in the last three years? I mean, seriously. What have they done for him? Yes, I, I get it. We, we've got, you know, great judges appointed and whatever, and Mitch McConnell has his legacy. But name me one hearing that has been championed by the Senate we control in the name of democracy to protect all Americans. Not one has occurred in the last two years. And that is a travesty. It's a travesty. So um, we, it's up to us. It's truly up to us. Thank you for your How do we get God back in government? I've got three hours for this one, right? Oh. Right? right? <laughs> How do we get God back in government? Okay, here's the first part. Number one, which government? Because those who are on the conservative side, I have a lot of problem with people who come up to me and say, hey, when is Donald Trump or when is... DC going to fix X, Y, and Z. Well, hang on a second. Do you know how our nation was founded? Washington was meant to be the irrelevance. Federal government was supposed to do national security, and that's about it until we got nuclear power. Nuclear power, the military, period, end of story. And you want to use Washington to fix stuff? Well, then you're not a Republican or a conservative. It's the states. So my question to you is, are you asking me about states or Washington, D.C.? How do we get the vision of our republic back? As far as I'm concerned, it starts at events like this that are state-based. <laughs> there, there is this, I see this in D.C., having worked in the White House and you know, being a public figure, even conservatives have this knee-jerk reaction. When's D.C. going to fix something? Excuse me? What? That should be the last response you have. You should be fixing things locally. You should be fixing things in your precinct. And only when it gets huge should it be at the state level, fi doing things nationally. It's, you know, today somebody said to me, why doesn't Washington get rid of whatever? I said, really? You want Washington to fix your problems? Hell no, is my response. Washington is our problem, yeah. not our solution. Right? So, um, sorry I'm getting a bit agitated, but hey, <laughs> big stuff. Um, I was told a lot of you have no idea I have a national radio show. And that's a travesty. I'm not part of federal government, but I'm national. So check it out. It's called America First. Follow me on Twitter, Facebook, all that stuff. Um, the show is available at my website, sebgorka.com, S-E-B-G-O-R-K-A, sebgorka.com. And, and let me say one last thing. It's up to you. Every single American in this room matters, and it is up to us. Be prayerful, never give up, and understand the stakes involved. This is going to be a crucial year. God bless you all. Thank you, Dr. Gorker. We really appreciate you, and uh, I know that everyone here Love your presentation.